it was during May of 1995 in Arizona's Tonto National Forest that two campers were taken aback after a fully loaded semi-truck barreled down the narrow forest road. What followed was a bizarre sequence of events. Multiple campers reported the same truck's erratic maneuvers and heard incoherent ramblings from the truck driver about prison and lighting fire. Later that afternoon, the truck was found marooned in the heart of the forest without its driver. The truck was later confirmed to belong to 29-year-old Devin Williams, who lived with his wife and three children in America's Kansas. Devin worked as a long-distance truck driver, often hauling produce from Midwest to West Coast. Devin was described as a patient, hard-working and a loving father, with the co-worker saying the only time she ever saw him get irritated was when he had to wait for his truck to be loaded as he was eager to get back home to his family. He adored his children and often talked about them. He and his wife Mary Lou had recently purchased a house and his wife later said that they were at the happiest point in their marriage. By all accounts, Devin seemed to be happy with his life. On May 23, 1995, Devin said goodbye to his family before setting off in his 18-wheeler truck out towards California to deliver a shipment and pick up a stock of lettuce on the return journey. It was a route he had taken many times before. Devin reached his destination on time and called his boss, Tom Wilson. Tom said he did not recall anything out of the ordinary about their conversation. Devin picked up the return shipment and headed to Kansas City. On the evening of May 27th, Devin reached Kingman, Arizona, where he phoned headquarters for the last time. He said that he was unable to sleep, but that he was determined to get back on the road. He told them that he would be back in Kansas City on time on 29th May. However, he never made it. When he failed to reach at his delivery destination and no one had heard from him, he was reported missing. An alert was issued about the missing truck driver. Soon, police would learn that the day before Devin was reported missing, his truck had been found in the Tonto National Forest. However, Devin was nowhere to be seen. Witnesses had reported to the police that same truck had been terrorizing campers in Tonto National Forest. On May 28, two campers, Lynn and Jack Yarrington, reported that a 48-foot, 10-ton, 18-wheel semi-truck had been barreling through the narrow forest dirt road. The road in question was very narrow and normally not possible by a truck. This road, typically unsuitable for such large vehicles, is designed for smaller four-wheel drive vehicles. Nevertheless, Lynn said that the massive truck rumbled back and forth multiple times that morning through that same road, at one point almost running over two other campers who were driving in their car. The two campers were driving through a bend in the narrow road when they suddenly saw the truck barreling towards their car. Despite their attempts to signal and prompt the driver to slow down, the truck continued its relentless advance without slowing down. The startled campers were compelled to reverse their car and get out of the way. The campers later said that the driver of the semi-truck did not seem to have any expression on his face and never looked at them as if he recognized there was someone in front of him. The truck driver did not stop and sped off down the narrow road out of sight, ignoring the two people he nearly killed. Later that day, two hikers found the truck in a field in the middle of the forest. The truck seemed to have been stuck in the mud. One of the hikers yelled out to the driver asking him how he had gotten his truck into the forest. The driver responded, They made me do it. Perplexed, the hiker asked for clarification, to which the driver mumbled to himself, No, you can't help me out. I'll never get it out of here. I'm going to jail. The hiker assumed that they had just stumbled onto a hostage situation, a hijacking or a kidnapping. 
and that perhaps someone in the truck might have coerced the driver possibly with a gun into undertaking actions that he believed would lead to his incarceration. However, the hikers were doubtful of a foul play as the driver did not make any attempts to keep them there or ask for their help. The driver then wandered off into the forest and disappeared. The hikers reported the incident to the police. Deputy Dean Wells from Coconino County Sheriff's Office followed up on the bizarre report and found the maroon truck. The truck was stuck in the mud in the meadow near Forest Service Road 137 in the Buck Springs area about 20 miles from Highway 87. He searched the inside of the truck and found it to be clean and well looked after. The refrigeration unit was running and the cargo, about 1,200 boxes of lettuce and strawberries, were intact. There was no sign of a struggle and nothing seemed to be missing, but there was no sign of the driver. The deputy checked the national crime computer but found no reports of either a missing truck or a driver. The truck was confirmed to belong to Devin Williams, but at the time, Devin or his truck was not reported missing. A few hours before Devin was reported missing, Lynn and Jack Yarrington came across the truck driver walking on foot in the forest. They said that he was seemingly in trance and was talking to himself. Concerned, they stopped their car and asked if he needed any help. But the entranced trucker cryptically replied, I got to light the grill. To their surprise, he proceeded to strike a $20 bill with a rock, as if attempting to start a fire. This peculiar behavior led the campers to suspect he was insane. Before they could inquire further, the man abruptly turned and threw a rock at their car, prompting them to hastily drive away. This was the last time the truck driver was seen alive. The witnesses who saw the truck driver were confident the driver acting strangely in the forest that day was indeed Devin Williams. A search for Devin Williams was launched after he was reported missing on May 29th. However, nothing would be found. People theorized that Devin was acting strangely because he was on drugs. However, people close to him do not believe that. According to his boss, Devin never had any drug problems and he passed all of the drug tests that he took through work. Another theory was that he vanished voluntarily. Interestingly, he had taken his duffel bag and cassette tapes but left his briefcase behind. His family did not believe that he would have left them behind. On May 2, 1997, two years after Devin was last seen, hikers found the human skull at the bottom of Mogollon Rim, about a quarter mile from where Devin was last seen. Dental records confirmed that the remains were of Devin Williams. There was no evidence of trauma to the skull that would indicate foul play. Although no foul play was suspected, the circumstances surrounding Devin Williams' disappearance remain unclear. On July 18, 2017, at around 6 p.m., 13-year-old Marissa Shen left her home in Burnaby, British Columbia, Canada to go to a nearby Tim Hortons restaurant. However, she never returned home. Her mother tried calling her, but her phone was switched off. When she failed to return home by 11 p.m., her mother reported her missing to the police. Initially, police did not take the matter seriously, assuming the girl might have been with friends or her phone had died. Her mother insisted that Marissa always returned home before 8 p.m. The police then checked Marissa's phone GPS which last pinged in Central Park about an hour earlier. Police then launched a search of the Central Park, searching along the foot trails inside the park. Soon, an officer in the southeast area of the park discovered a cartoon wallet shaped like a pink owl and a switched-off phone near a small path. A student ID with the name Marissa was found nearby. At 1.10 a.m., less than two hours after she was reported missing, police found her body near the Patterson Avenue. 
She was pronounced dead at the scene. She was wearing the same clothes that she had been wearing earlier that day. An autopsy revealed that Marissa had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. The police later classified her death as a homicide by a random attack. As police tried to trace back her movements before her death, they found CCTV footage of Marissa leaving her apartment at 6.02 p.m. She was then seen at 6.09 p.m. entering Tim Horton's restaurant, located on the 6200 block of McKay Avenue near Central Boulevard. She was wearing black t-shirt and denim shorts. She remained at the restaurant for the next hour and a half. She was captured leaving the restaurant at 7.37 p.m. Before she exits, she places her plastic iced coffee cup into the recycling bin and her garbage into the waste bin. Marissa was then seen heading towards the Central Park. The murder of the young girl within a large city park became the top priority case for the police. Investigators interviewed more than 2,000 people and followed several leads. Despite an extensive investigation, no one was charged. Then, on September 7, 2018, police announced that they have arrested a man in connection with Marissa's murder. 28-year-old Ibrahim Ali was charged with the first-degree murder of Marissa Shen. Using the DNA found on Marissa, authorities used DNA phenotyping to determine that the girl's killer was likely a man of a Middle Eastern descent. DNA phenotyping, also known as snapshot DNA, is a technique where scientists analyze DNA samples to digitally reconstruct the facial features of a perpetrator. This includes details such as hair color, height, ethnicity, gender, and even facial structure, aiding in the identification of the suspect. According to the genetic phenotyping analysis, the perpetrator in Marissa's case was estimated to be between 25 and 35 years old with dark hair, matching eyebrows, light brown skin, a slender face, a long nose, and a distinctive groove on the chin. Moreover, DNA analysis indicated that the individual originated from the Middle East, specifically the northern regions including Syria, Lebanon, northern Turkey, and a small area of Iraq. Armed with this information, the police asked the men of Middle Eastern descent who lived around Central Park in Burnaby to voluntarily submit their DNA to be eliminated from the suspect pool. It is unclear if Ibrahim voluntarily provided his DNA sample or if investigators linked him through familial DNA. Ibrahim Ali was a 28-year-old refugee from Syria living in Burnaby, British Columbia. He had no prior criminal record and worked as an exterior wall decorator for a construction company. Ibrahim's journey to Canada was influenced by the Syrian civil war and the resulting refugee crisis. Now, there are two types of refugees. There are government-sponsored refugees comprising of 25,000 to 30,000 individuals brought to Canada directly by the government. The second category includes privately sponsored refugee claimants supported by the family members, church groups or non-profit organizations. Ibrahim's brother had been a government-sponsored refugee in Canada, prompting a community group on Bowen Island to initiate efforts to reunite Ibrahim's remaining family members. With successful fundraising, they sponsored Ibrahim and two other brothers along with their families, aiming to bring them together after being separated by the conflict. Ibrahim had arrived in Canada as a refugee in April 2017 just three months before the murder of Marissa. Ibrahim became a permanent resident of Canada sometime before his first court appearance on September 14, 2018, with the trial initially set for October 12, 2018, but the trial was subsequently pushed back to September 2022 and then again to January 2023. The trial eventually commenced in April 2023, nearly six years after Marissa's murder. When asked for his plea in court, Ibrahim Ali said three times through a Kurdish-speaking interpreter that he did not kill Marissa. 
the trial encountered several unexpected developments when Dr. Tracy Pickett, the forensic expert for the prosecution, was discovered dead in a wooded area near the site of Marissa's murder. Authorities eventually concluded her death as a suicide attributing it to her enduring struggle with depression, which was exacerbated by the emotional toll of Marissa's murder. During the trial, prosecution presented evidence and told the court that Marissa had been sexually assaulted and strangled, and that the semen found inside her body matched Ibrahim's DNA. Ibrahim's lawyer resorted to baseless accusations against the deceased, insinuating Marissa was a troubled teen who had bad relations with her mother. He claimed that the girl wasn't the innocent depicted in a rose-colored portrayal at the trial and may have found Ibrahim attractive, further suggesting that she had consensual sex with Ibrahim. He even claimed that after consensual sex, Ibrahim left and that someone else may have murdered Marissa. These unfounded allegations sparked outrage. The girl's brother accused Ibrahim's lawyers of dragging his sister's name through the mud. The defense attorney claimed that he had received death threats, presenting letter and a voicemail threatening to knock the lawyer's teeth out and as for his client, Ibrahim Ali, the anonymous caller says, I'm gonna cut him. The lawyer had asked the proceedings to be moved to a secure courtroom in light of what he said was a litany of death threats against defense lawyers and their families. However, the judge said he did not know if any court was available and the move did not take place. Marissa's father was arrested by the Vancouver Police Department for allegedly bringing a loaded Glock pistol to the courtroom on the last day of the trial with the intent to kill the defense counsel. The father was later released pending further investigation by the police. Ibrahim Ali was eventually found guilty of first-degree murder. However, his sentencing is yet to be taken place. Although a first-degree murder conviction in Canada carries a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole for 25 years.